Hi, my name is uh, Brian Mulligan. I'm from the Institute of Technology Sligo, where I've been uh, teaching here since 1984, and um, I've been working on online distance learning for the last 13 years, since about 2003. Uh, I'd like to talk to you this morning about how we do online learning in IT Sligo, and more specifically about how lectures are um, allocated hours towards the teaching. So very quickly, um, we've been building up a bit of a reputation in online learning with uh, a certain amount of press coverage and awards that we've got, the most recent being the Engineers Ireland Excellence Award for Education. Um, the student numbers have been growing significantly. There seems to be great demand out there. We're uh, we're up at around 1,100 or possibly a little bit more this year. It's probably around over 20% of our total student numbers and maybe around uh, 12 or 13% of whole time equivalent. So there's a good number of students there. Um, growth to a certain extent has been lateral growth, you could say, because uh, we, uh, uh, we have developed a lot of programs with fairly modest levels of enrollment rather than developing a small number of programs with large scale enrollment. You can see there we have a lot of level 7, level 8 and level 9 add-on courses. We also have some level 6 courses, particularly level 6 uh, qualifier type courses to get people ready for level 7 that might not have the full uh, qualifications to get into level 7. Um, we have students from outside Ireland, uh, a modest but significant number of students from outside Ireland that just goes to show you the demand there is for Irish education worldwide. These are people who might stumble across us, might have heard about us, some Irish people overseas, uh, and we take them on a case-by-case -case basis and try to facilitate them in whatever way we can. Um, uh, the large companies uh, very much like what we do I suppose it provides a lot of our uh, courses are in pharmaceuticals manufacturing so those are the types of companies who would like it and it provides very flexible access to uh, to their employees for education so it's very convenient for them and they're and they're in most cases prepared to pay the fees of their students we also have quite a few uh, unemployed students uh, funded under springboard Okay, so how do we manage to uh, scale this up so much over the years? Um, let's have a look at a few ways we didn't do it. It wasn't with big grants and big investments. Uh, it was actually quite a frugal approach we took to it. So we didn't need, we, no, we did need some money, but we didn't need a lot of money. It certainly wasn't with very sophisticated multimedia technology. We took a pretty simple approach to it as an approach that would suit uh, lecturers appro or as opposed to an approach that would tend to be uh, technology oriented. Um, as I say, and, and again we didn't use complicated technologies either. Um, the technologies, it was important that lecturers be able to use the technology, it was important that uh, they didn't have to develop a lot of exper expertise in order to put their courses online. So some of the guiding principles would have been to keep it simple, okay, not have the technology or other things distracting from the teaching that was to go on, so keep it simple. Uh, put the lecturer in control, and um, basically the lecturer is the expert in the topic and the lecturer probably knows best how to teach that topic and to tailor the teaching approach for the particular topic. And not a one size fits all. And this is a, a development of the last slide, I suppose, because if we developed a supposedly efficient way of teaching and then forced all lecturers to use that way of teaching, uh, that might not be appropriate for the topic or the target group. So we don't have one type of teaching that fits all. We try to get the idea through to those teaching online. It's not about your content, it's about the communication. So uh, it's not a matter of taking the content and putting it up online. It's a matter of communicating with the students and getting the students to communicate with each other. And from that, we would hold that 
the learning that goes on in a module or a program it's a process it's not a commodity that you can just take and package it up and replicate it cheaply it's a process that students are brought through very much under the guidance of the lectures so we could say let's give the lectures the tools show them how to use them and then give them the freedom to decide how best they want to teach so some details of how we teach online uh, the main tool we use is um, the tool I'm recording from at the moment actually it's audio connect uh, uh, Adobe connect it's used for live classes online it's called a web conferencing system it's called synchronous or live uh, the lecture is teaching live online and the students are present and the students can be texting back questions or they can put up their hand and put on their microphone uh, it's very much in the style of how uh, lectures already teach in a class I suppose they can't see the eyes and the faces of the students but with a little bit of effort they can um, encourage participation by the students in the class and get a really good idea of how they are getting across to the students so it's quite an effective and quite a natural form of teach, uh, teaching for a lot of lectures of course these are recorded also for those that can't make it to class because of the demands of their work and their family lives and whatever uh, each module would also have a, a web page uh, we use Moodle for it yeah, you could use Blackboard for it, but that's available 24-7 for all the students. Links to the live classes are there. Links to recordings are there so they can listen at any stage. They can take part in discussions, take quizzes, submit assignments, look for support, uh, access other learning materials that may be linked to on the web. So uh, possibly rather than giving physical handouts, a lecturer might just upload their PowerPoint slides, but probably more important is that they are more powerful is that they're able to access very large numbers of open educational resources there's just a wealth of great learning materials out there that they can link to online to augment what the lecturer might be doing in a live class no need to write manuals in this because there is so much good stuff out there in the learning now an important part of the approach to learning would be that uh, the would be that the students have to do more on their own we would probably reduce the amount of live classes compared to say what you might do in the evening classes and increase the amount of independent learning the students has to do through reading assignments augmented reading uh, access to other resources on the web but to ensure that the students do this learning they would be given assignments uh, exercises or activities that would force them to engage with the learning materials that they have been supplied with now du during those they, du while they're carrying out those assignments they would have access to support and that support wouldn't be just from the lecturer but it would also be from their classmates through forums within the learning management system and when they submit their assignments they would get feedback on these so it, it, it is a good way to do learning to get the students to engage with the learning materials this is just an example of a forum where somebody asks a question and somebody else responds to it a typical peer support in a course and this is where a student might submit an assignment and get some feedback submitted in Microsoft Word format uh, um, I noticed that it's late here this one but they've got a grade so I'm sure 24 minutes late they were I doubt if they were penalized that heavily for that okay now this is quite important um, people do claim that you can't teach everything online and that's quite correct you can't and there are certain things you probably shouldn't teach online and bring them in where they have to come in now we've probably found that we can teach more stuff online as time goes on and we our techniques get better we can teach more online than we originally thought but don't it's not an issue to be forced you know if it's not the best way to do it bring them in and we do that so it, in those cases it would be considered a form of blended learning now what sort of staff training do we need um, it's 
fairly minimal because it's a, a relatively simple approach is taken, you know, just using the virtual learning environment to uh, upload materials, to upload links, to create areas where they can submit assignments, maybe to put up quizzes. Uh, to have forums where they can discuss things. It's relatively straightforward. I we would say about six hours training and six hours practice for that. And an awful lot of our lecturers have most of these skills already before they start teaching online. Uh, live classes would be new to a lot of them, but they, it's really a fairly simple technology. This I've often described it as Skype on steroids. So the probably two hours training would probably be enough for this, plus about two hours practice and teaching strategies, it is important that people consider how they teach online. As I say, the model is not that different from um, full-time learning, but uh, or for, from evening classes because of the live, but it does have to be tweaked because there's a larger amount of independent learning and it's probably very important to have activities and assignments that cover all the learning outcomes, that cover all the materials that want to be covered. So that's about 20 hours and as I say I'll probably a lot of lectures have about half that done already in their use of a learning environment. Now this is just to finish off now I'd like to talk about time allocation because it's very important. Now one of the reasons I would say that online learning has been successful in IT Sligo is that even on in a on, a, a, on the basis of practice, I suppose, two very important principles have generally been accepted with regards to allocating hours to teachers for teaching online. And these two principles are as follows. If you reduce the contact time, the direct contact time, that's the live teaching with students, that does not mean a reduced workload and the teaching hours allocated should not be reduced. That's more or less been accepted here in this institution. And in addition, the larger the class size, the larger the amount of the workload. And that's been accepted as well. Let's just have a look at the two of these. Reduce contact time. Typically, you might look at evening classes that a lecturer, just say a lecturer was given evening classes over a period of five years and you have to divide up the work because obviously the preparation is heavier in the first years. You might, it might come out something like this. A certain amount of time for preparation, a certain amount of time for delivery, a significant amount of time for delivery, and then giving support to students or assessment, probably work that's done outside the classroom after the delivery. Now, if we move it online and we accept the idea that some of this is going, to, it's not all going to be taught live, that there's going to be other learning materials as well, this live delivery time will reduce but it will reduce, it will result in higher preparation time. And we also know because that the students have better access to the uh, lecture through forums, you know, 24 seven, they can get on those forums and depending on how, the le how compelled the lecturer feels to answer emails or to read their emails or to go on the site, that workload can build up. So there is more support and access. Uh, but it's generally be, been accepted that uh, whatever hours you might be given to deliver this in the evenings, even though your delivery time might be lower, you would get the same number of hours to deliver online. So typically a two hour class in the evening might be delivered in one hour per week plus the the pointers to other learning materials that the students would use but the lecturer would still be given the two hours to do it. That's the principle. Now the next one is about larger class sizes. Uh, I've checked around the country and I get a feeling that there is a general time allocation of about for a five credit module delivered over one semester there's probably about two hours a week uh, allocated, irrespective of class size, by the way. So it doesn't matter, there's two hours allocated. Well, we would take the approach that we would allocate about 1.5 hours to teach the class and then give uh, 20, one hour for every 25 students in the class or 0 0.04 hours per student. So that if you had 25 students in the class, you'd have two and a half hours, 35, 
or sorry, 50, you'd have 3.5 hours. And if you had 75 students in the class, and that's a huge class for an evening class, but it does happen from time to time online. We have a few of that online. You would get four and a half hours and so on like that. So obviously this is going to be a, a heavier burden on the department in terms of teaching resources if you successfully recruit a lot of students online. However, if you say we're charging fees such that at around 25 students you are breaking even. Okay, I haven't really talked about unit teaching cost here or the unit fee cost, but we'll just put that line in. That line shows that the fees are breaking even at around 25 students. It will be up here around 35, 38, where uh, you'd be breaking even with online students. And our experience has been that if you can recruit a certain amount of students to evening classes, you can re recruit a multiple of that to online because of your bigger geographical reach and because of the convenience. Now this means that above this, the institution is in a position that either it's making a profit that can be funded back to into the system to help the department, to help with technology, training, whatever, or there would be the scope to take the fees and reduce them because of the larger class sizes. So we would contend that there is a win-win situation here for both the lecturers and the institution and for the students as well insofar as the institution is able to get higher enrollment to make it pay or make it generate some funding uh, but can make it pay uh, the lecturer is properly awarded or allocated extra time to deal with the larger class sizes and the students get better access to courses and possibly lower fees if the uh, institution uh, chooses to do that. So I'd just like to say again that we believe that this time allocation model is a progressive model that uh, generates um, benefits for both the institution and the lecturers, uh, properly allocating them time and allowing these courses to be, I suppose, sustainable for the institution. Um, thank you very much for listening to the presentation. If you have any questions, you can email me on mulligan.brian at itslygo.ie.